This amateur radio roundtable is brought to you in part by ICOM America. Good evening to everyone out there uh, listening on the airways and also that's uh, watching on W5KUB.com out on the internet. Uh, we want to welcome you uh, tonight to uh, Amateur Radio Roundtable. I'm Tom Medlin, W5KUB, and with me is Martin FQ, K5FLU. Hey, Martin, how you doing? Good, Tom. I'm glad to be here with you. Well, you know, this is kind of unusual. You're in the studio with us t tonight, and uh, we... Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Oh, well, thanks for inviting me. I had to uh, bring my wife up to Memphis to the airports for her to go visit her sister, and Tom was good enough to invite me to his home and studio here. And uh, I'm just so surprised that on such short notice, there's so many have logged on. Yeah, well, hey, we always, uh, hey, you're always welcome here, and we're, we're glad we got you. And, you know, I forgot this time to say what the date was, so I'm going to say today <laughs> is uh, Tuesday, November 21st, and we've got Thanksgiving coming up here. Boy, Thanksgiving is one of my special holidays. I, I think that's the most special holiday for me uh, throughout the year. And we're going to be in North Carolina Thanksgiving uh, at our home over in North Carolina, uh, but uh, we just want to show to... Uh, to uh, continue to uh, go on, and that's why we're on here today. Hey, it's going to be a free for all. We don't we don't have any agenda for the show tonight. We're going to talk about anything and everything ham radio related. Uh, if you've got questions, put them in the chat room uh, for uh, for Martin, and uh, we will um, uh, we'll take your questions. In fact, I, I'm going to uh, also open up some phone lines here in a minute. Um, I didn't open the phone line, but I'm going to open the phone line. So uh, we'll have phone lines available here in just a little while, too. So, um, hey, you know, we're going to talk about anything and everything, and I'm just going to get it started right now. Uh, uh, Martin, uh, you know, I, I've been building and working with some antennas lately, and, and uh, that's kind of one of the things that people can do now. Well, spending a lot of money or, or or having to buy radios and stuff, and it's it's fun building antennas and experimenting with them. So over the years, you've been a ham now, sixty years almost. Oh, uh, pretty years. close to it. Nineteen since nineteen sixty. Yeah. yeah. So what what kind of antennas did you use throughout the years? Well, you know, all of us started off with dipos, and um, but one antenna that I remember uh, very well was on 20 meters, uh, I had built a uh, extended double zap, which is basically two five-eighths waves. And you can get about 3 dB gain over a dipole antenna, and all it takes is a little bit more wire. And this was back in the real early days uh, when I had just gotten into ham radio. You know, didn't have any money, didn't have any experience, but, you know, I could read. Uh, from the handbook or from some magazines. Um, but anyway, I built that antenna using wire uh, that came from an electromagnet from a speaker. You know, back then, we didn't have good magnets. And in order for a speaker to work, they had to build an electromagnet, which uh, uh, essentially was a piece of iron with a lot of wire on it. So these old radios that were built back in the 30s that I got from my radio t TV repairman friend, I could unwind that wire and use it for an antenna. That was soft copper wire, so after a while it would sag and break. But making this antenna, a normal dipole antenna, is about 36 feet or so long, 33 to 36 uh, feet long, an extended double zip. Uh, was about 90 feet long, and um, I, I ran uh, TV twin lead, 300 ohm twin lead, lead to it, and brought it down to a home built single band antenna tuner that was tuned using a flashlight light bulb. Uh, connected to that flashlight light bulb was a coil of wire, maybe two or three turns that you held close to the a uh, coil in the antenna tuner, and you tuned it for maximum brightness. And with that antenna, I got out all over the place. I mean, it was really a good antenna. 
and it didn't cost anything. Well, that was, that was simple back then. And your, your tuning indicator was this little bulb with a little inductor you held near your coil. And That's right. You tuned up until that bulb uh, got, bright, got bright, and that, that was it, you know. And you're talking about those little speakers. I wish I had uh, pulled up a, a picture of one. And probably a lot of people nowadays have never seen that, or they probably don't know what we're talking about because I'm, I'm really old, so I, I do remember that. <laughs> But, you know, back then, uh, these, these old Zeniths and different radios, boy, they had these speakers, you know, about this big around in there. And they had a, like Martin was saying, they had a big coil on the center where the magnet normally is. They had a big coil there and a piece of iron. And uh, that's what gave the speaker the magnetic uh, uh, properties to, to work. And uh, that coil also used to uh, have a second function as the choke coil in the power supply. But uh, yeah, I used to tear transformers up and, and coils like that to get wire mm -hmm. out of. And uh, yeah, you know, it really, I, yeah. growing up, that was, I don't think I ever, ever had a shortage of wire. Yeah, no, we had plenty of wire. And you know, like you were saying earlier, you know, if that speaker went bad, what in later days, what they usually did was to replace the speaker with a permanent magnet. but but left the coil there because it was part of the power supply for right. filtering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, boy, I miss those little radios. I, I had an old Zenith, boy. Zenith, you know, with the round dial. It had the, the, the I-tube in it, uh -huh. a, AM, shortwave. They, they didn't know what FM was uh -huh. then. Well, you know, you know. I, and I remember we had an old Philco radio, and uh, you had to have an antenna on it, so you would sit there in front of it you would put you would hold the antenna and you were the antenna oh you yeah yeah sit there and listen to programs like the long ranger and and uh hop along cassidy i mean it was like watching television you you just sit in front of it and listen to the programs oh yeah, yeah. well that was uh that was the excitement back then everybody yeah. would get around the around the radio and you know yeah. I, I i saw an article the other day i was reading about back then people had rather give away their refrigerator or, or some other household thing and keep the radio yeah. because that was a central uh, focal point, you know, of the house here. So, you know, I, uh, that's, that's cool, uh, building antennas, and uh, again, that's fun. Well, you know, what about operating, Martin? Uh, did, how much operating did you do? Uh, are, are you active now on the ham bands much? Or well, tell not us about that. all that much, but I do get on. Uh, get on CW uh, on 40, 20 meters, and uh, I was fairly active mobile um, because I was uh, driving between Starkville, Mississippi, and Atlanta to, to see our uh, two grandkids. I've got a three-year-old granddaughter and a seven-month-old grandson, and it's about a five-hour drive, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. And I can use my mobile and just, you know, pass the time away and have a good time talking to people on 20 and 40 meters. What what kind of radio you run mobile? <laughs> well, you know, I've got lots of radio. This was a radio I bought off of um, uh, eBay, and I was using a TS50. It's a really yeah, old okay. radio. Yeah, yeah, TS50. But it's really simple to use, and this is great for mobile. You only have to push a button or two, and you don't have to go through a bunch of menus. Well, yeah. Yeah. Radios have become really complicated. You know, I think I'm just getting too old and too tired to try to work all the menus and stuff on them. Yeah. Well, especially driving, it makes it pretty yeah. hard. You know, back in the day when you just had knobs to turn buttons to push yeah. it, it was a lot simpler, wasn't it? Well, you know? just like the new cars now. You know, the old cars, you push a button and it did one thing. Now you have to go through a menu just to turn something out. Yeah, uh, I, I know what you were talking about there. But well, usually when I operate at home, it's usually on CW. Uh, once in a while I will get on sideband, but not very often. Uh, well, um, you know, we were talking a little about antennas, and now we get mobile. But let me jump back to antennas. Uh, Martin, you know uh, some of us are experimenting, and we're building our own cobweb. And that's a, a neat little antenna. And uh, if you've been following us on Facebook, guys, you see that we're uh, – I've got the, the matching, uh, I guess, uh, circuit. It's uh, two toroids and some coax that uh, – 
supposed to give us a 12 and a half to 50 ohm match. So that'll be going in next, and we'll be reporting on that on the show. And um, you know, Martin, I was looking at this. This is that little RG316 coax, and I looked the specs up on this. I can't believe it. The specs say at 10 megahertz, this stuff is good for 2,000. It's, it's good for 1,800 watts. Well. It's silver plated and some kind of Teflon, and yeah, you know. I think that's the key to it. It's a Teflon. And, and, yeah, and then you know, uh, up as high as 30 megahertz, it's good for just a little under a kilowatt. So, wow. uh, th th I, that's just hard for me to believe that it's that you know. Mm -hmm. Now they make it. What is it? RG 174. 174. Yeah. It's about the same size, mm -hmm. but he, you know, in the plans, he he specifies not to use more than 100 watts on that. Mm -hmm. If you want high power, to use the RG213. Now, again, that looks awful small to me, but I guess the Teflon's the key. Well, it is the key for for the uh, uh, power handling of coax. But let me mention why you want to use this transformer. You know, a cobweb is really a full-size dipole that's bent into a square. And any time you reduce the overall length of it, the impedance drops. And in this case, it goes from 50 ohms down to about 12 and a half ohms. So you have to get it back up to 50 ohms, and that's why Tom has that transformer in it. Well, we're going to see uh, how this works. Now, Martin, tell us, how can I test this with one of the antenna analyzers? If I want to see if this gives me a, that true 4 to 1, what, what can I do? You know, I got a 12 and a half ohm side, and I got a 50 ohm side. Okay. Well, on a 12 and a half ohm side, just connect the 12 and a half ohm resistor there, and then connect on the 50 ohm side uh, the SWR analyzer. And if it's one to one, you know that 12 and a half ohm has been transformed up to 50 ohms. And you can also sweep it across a wide frequency range and see where it stays okay. SWR one to one. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but that should give me an indication. For, mm -hmm. for how how wide how uh, broadband this is, of mm -hmm. course, the 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 plan here is to get this down to twenty meters at least, right? Uh, to oh, down yeah. to fourteen yeah. megahertz and up to about thirty. Oh yeah, you, you so should we'll be, we'll see how that goes. It should easily cover twenty uh, meters up through ten meters. So, you know, uh, I'm going to say, well, Martin, I mean, I, I and I've got probably a thousand resistors, but. I probably don't have a 12 and a half ohm resistor. So well, why can't I take a, a pot, uh, or maybe a, a, a 10 turn pot or something? I guess I probably should use a carbon resistor, not a wire wound, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's so could, couldn't, I take, couldn't I take a, a, a pot and just uh, uh, set it with the, with the uh, ohm meter for 12 and a half ohms? You can. And connect that across there. You can. The only thing you have to watch for is uh, if the pot has too much capacitance or too much inductance, mm. and you can also take four 50 ohm well, resistors I, yeah. and put them in parallel and get 12 I could and do that. Ohms, I, yeah. I could, yeah. That, that's, and you know, uh, in, in on a, a previous show, you talked about when you were building stuff back as a kid and you didn't have a, a, a resistor, how you would take a file, like a triangle shaped file, I yeah. guess, and yeah. you would cut through that resistor yeah, that and worked, change it. That worked really good. Those were back in the days of carbon composition resistors, and you could, like Tom is saying, just take a file and just file down the middle of it and increase that resistance to whatever you want. And, you know, I used to put an ohmmeter across the resistor. Mm -hmm and just kept filing it until I got exactly the value that I wanted. Well, you know, in, in my days of building, I never really thought about that, or I never did that. Uh, I, I always found uh, a combination of, transis of, of resistors that, of course, would put me uh, near that value. And, you know, uh, Martin, I, even today in building things, I've noticed th things have such a wide tolerance today. If you build little circuits, you know, if it calls for you know, a, you know, a, a, a 270 ohm resistor, I bet you could put a 350 in there or a 150 in there, and the circuit would probably still work. Yeah, yeah, probably would. So it's a, but it, that that's a, a kind of a, an interesting point where you would actually modify the resistor by oh, yeah. by filing into it, and and changing the uh, resistance there. Well, the other thing we did like that was uh, disceramic capacitors. You know, you could 
take one like a point oh one and break it in half and you would have point oh oh five uh microfarad capacitor. Uh huh. Now I never did capacitors like that. Uh but uh yeah, I, I yeah, I understand it. That's uh that's cool. Yeah. I'm gonna put the phone number up there. We'll just go ahead and put the phone number up. If anybody does want to call, phone number is is on the screen there and we'll take some calls here. Looks like KO6PS just joined us. Uh, I don't know if he's in, uh, you know, you can't tell nowadays where a 6 is. He might be uh, in, in Memphis. You know, you just can't yeah. tell. No, back in the old days, you know, whatever con mm -hmm. district we're in, uh, your call uh, could, you know, you could tell where he, where he was, kind of where he was, but no more. And, and, and back then, too, I mean, back in early years, I don't know what year they changed it. If you moved from one region to the other, you had to change your call, yep. I think, to that region. And you don't do that anymore. So yeah. you just you keep your call and uh, you, you move anywhere. Well, hey, guys, if anybody wants to call us, 901-286-1116, and uh, we'll be glad to uh, let you in here if you've got a question or just want to talk about ham radio. We like talking about the old-time stuff, man, you know. We like talking about 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, it was a lot different back then. Um, oh, it's, it's pretty incredible what radios can do nowadays. It's incredible that we were able to make contacts back then, uh, to tell you the truth. You know? you know, one thing I wanted to do is my original receiver that I had, I must have been in the 7th grade, 8th grade, was a uh, night kit space spanner regenerative receiver and I still have it and I want to uh, and I tried back then to make contacts using that but I never could make contacts because when I went from transmit to receive the frequency would change and you couldn't hear the guy anymore but I want to put that thing back on the air and and use some low power and see if I can make a contact with a regenerative receiver well they used to do it many years ago who's on yeah. the phone Hey Tom, this is Bill W Z one L. Hey Bill. Hey Bill. How I you have doing, a question man? from uh, Martin. Uh, this uh, all band eighty to ten meter N fed half wave antenna that you sell there. Um, I have a question in regards to the grounding of that. Uh, my shack is located on the second floor of my home. And um, I, I realized that, you know, the, the closer to the, uh, the ground uh, your station is, uh, the, the better uh, grounding potential you have. Um, would I have to put more than one ground rod for that, or would I just uh, uh, use a single one? Well, I think you would be fine with uh, not much of a ground at all. Those What's are, that antenna? Uh, that's what a half-wave yeah. NFED. And because it's a half-wave NFED, what that means is the impedance, the impedance feed point is a really high impedance. So it doesn't take much of a ground uh, for that antenna to work. And you're right, it covers all those frequency just from feeding it from the end. So, so, so it sounds okay. like you don't, you don't have to have just a great ground system for that antenna. It, it should probably still work. Uh huh. Well, I was I was just curious, you know, if if I was going to run into problems, and uh, um, you see, I, I see that it's a uh, 132 feet. Um, I could probably get one leg up to the top of a tree, and then you know, the the other one would uh, kind of uh, uh, go off at a 45 degree angle from it so i mean you know i, I was just curious uh yeah. well this is a single what, wire right this yeah. is a, a in fed right you're it's talking about bending i think he's talking about bending yeah. it, when it for legs yeah you can do that yeah. just drape it over a tree limb and uh but yeah it's only one end that you feed yeah so it, it should work okay uh bill hey looks like we've got all right, hey, yeah. i think i thank you for taking the call and uh uh, I hope that more people call in. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks, Bill. You're, you're welcome. Looks like we've got to uh, nice e see you again there, Martin, and uh, take care. Okay. Thanks for right. coming, Bill. We've got uh, 
We've got a, it looks like Spain has joined us. I think it's, well, it may not yeah. be, EA3HSO, yeah. it's somewhere near Spain. I think so. Uh, has joined us. Uh, we'll say uh, hello to you. Uh, do you know any Spanish? No, I haven't um, hard enough time talking redneck English. Well, you know, <laughs> but we're both in the South. We can understand <laughs> each other here, you know. So, uh, uh, como esta usted? Uh, I'll, I'll start it off with a little Spanish there. <laughs> All right, that's to uh, EA3 HSO. Uh, you're uh, watching uh, 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 Amateur Radio Roundtable, and we're coming to you from Cargerville, Tennessee tonight. And we've got Martin F. Jew, uh, the founder and president of MFJ, with us tonight. If you got any questions, uh, uh, send them in a chat room or call the phone number. Okay, He's in yeah. Barcelona. Yeah, I see that. That's that's good. You Barcelona. Know one of our engineers is from Spain. I think okay. he's from Barcelona, maybe Madrid. I can't remember now. All right. Hey, wow. look here. We've got an extra last oh, week. Wow. That's a KG5 TLT Jim. Got his extra last week. That's a great. Oh, great. Yeah. You know, Martin, we started with our general license. We had the whole band, didn't we? Uh, well, we did, but... Um, In the 70s, they started taking it away. Uh, yeah, parts of it. Uh, that's right. That's right. Well, actually, when when I started, it I was a novice. Okay, yeah. So we were limited. Oh yeah. Well, to we CW were limited men. here. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, once we got that general, we had all the privileges and, and all the handbands. Well, you know, they had something that was the predecessor of the VE, <coughs> which was uh, called the conditional class, which mm -hmm. was a general class, but it was given by some volunteer hands right. back then. And I think, what, wasn't yeah. the requirements you had to be like 150 miles or something away right. from a testing place? Yeah, that's right. You couldn't, you know, it was a problem getting to the FCC office, so if you were far enough, you could get the conditional class, which is yeah. what I did. We had to go to New Orleans from uh, Hollandale, Mississippi, and that was real hardship. Yeah. John's saying thank you, Martin, for adding the 30 and 40 uh, meter add on kit to the cobweb uh, and making the parts individually ordered there. We got Santa Rosa, California ordered us, uh, uh, joined us. Oh. Uh, and hello, Spike uh, W4AAX. Not sure where you are, but we're talking with Martin here tonight. And uh, hey, it's a, it's a, uh, no, no, uh, no agenda tonight. We're going to talk about everything. Boy, we've been talking about antennas and radios and. Let, let me mention yeah. one thing. You know, uh, I guess it's John <coughs> KC Seven DRI. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but you know, any any of the parts, if you want to build your own cobweb antenna, they're available for from us. The uh, fiberglass tubing, the transformer, the wire, uh, the insulators, any of those you can order from us uh, individually. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, we're going to build a cobweb antenna that's much stronger uh, that will include the 30 and 40 meter band as part of the antenna. Uh, now the one that we have now goes from 20 uh, through 10 meters and you can get 30 and 40 as an add-on kit. Well, once I get mine working, I'm going to think about extending it and putting that 40 on here. But that's going to make it a little bit larger. It's going to make it a pretty good bit larger. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but we're also going to bring out a two-element hex beam that will cover 20 through 6 meters. And then, uh, based on the frame of the, thir the uh, cobweb that includes 30 and 40 meters, we're going to bring out a hex beam f with three elements. Well, Martin, the cobweb you have today, it goes down to t or up to 10 meters. Um, would there be any problem putting six meters on there? No, I don't think there'd be any problems. I mean, should it that. just if you just put that six meter piece of wire on there, should it kind of fall in place? No special well, anything? Well, it, it should work fine. The only thing you have to worry about <coughs> is the transformer working at six. Oh, uh, at that frequency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Okay. Yeah, because that is stretching it from 30 on up to 50 there. Who, who we got on the phone? Hi, this is Joe, KO6PS here in California. KO6PS. Hey, Joe. How you doing, man? Out in California. Yeah, Joe. Glad to hear you. Well, Joe, how do you, how'd you, uh, how'd you find us and know we were on right now? This is not our, well, I'll just ask how you know we're on. <laughs> 
Well, I saw you post the number on the, uh, while I was viewing the, uh, uh, the broadcast. Yeah, okay, good, cool. And so, good. And so I was just calling to tell you that I've really been enjoying the last several shows about Ant Tennis. And uh, I also wanted to tell Martin that I picked up uh, the uh, MFJ 9200, uh, the little QRP radio with all the six-band modules, oh, last week. And I've been just having a lot of fun with it. I've already worked uh, uh, off of just the wire. I've worked Canada, Japan, Mexico, Hawaii, and Australia, and a handful of uh, uh, ops here in the United States also. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's great. Isn't it fun to be able to work those stations with such <coughs> low power and such a uh, simple antenna? I mean, that, that's real ham radio. It's just really a lot of fun. Yeah. It's amazing uh, what you can do with five band, five watts, especially with the band conditions of the solar uh, cycle of being at, at a low. Um, and also, I've been just really enjoying all the information about how to make antennas resonant. And I thoroughly want to thank you for, for coming on the show and sharing your wealth of information. I've been a ham since, well, I've been licensed since the early 70s. But yeah, I, I never stop learning. There's always more to learn, and, and I, I really appreciate everything that you've been sharing. Well, well, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. And and you're right. Ham radio is a learning hobby, and you know that's that's uh, one of the parts of it that I enjoyed most. And and I appreciate you calling in to to hear. And uh, um, we still have some of those ninety two hundred. Uh, transceivers with all the band modules. If anyone is interested in those, I think you you wrote, wrote asked me in an email. Tom. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> all right. Well, Joe, great to hear from you. Glad you uh, glad you joined us. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for getting me on the air. You guys keep up the good work. I'm going to go flip back over to where I can watch at the same time. Okay. Seventy three. Seventy three. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right, that was Joe, KO6PS in California, calling in. Okay. Hey, Martin, uh, someone's asking, you know, you got all kinds of, you know, people live in all kinds of different homes and restrictions, and here's a guy here that's, uh, he's in a, uh, let's see what he says he's in. He's in a, uh, he's in a motorhome. Okay. And he bought a lot in uh, New Mexico, and he's not permitted to put a wire antenna up on the lot. Mm. Uh, so he's wondering, uh, you know, he's he's mentioning like a Hustler 6BTV. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what the 6BTV is. Is is that a mobile antenna or just a vertical antenna? I think I it's a vertical antenna that has to be worked against ground. <clears throat> but we have several antennas that uh, will uh, work. In, for your uh, uh, situation, now, we have some that doesn't require any grounds. Uh, I think you ought to take a look at that cobweb antenna. That would be uh, almost ideal for you. Um, and he could put that cobweb on top of the motorhome, I yeah, guess. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, it surely wouldn't extend past it. At, well, let's see, a cobweb's going to be about... It's about eight feet eight on feet the side. Eight feet on the side, yeah. so that yeah. should fit... Yeah. Won't even hang over. Yeah, no, I think that would be an ideal antenna for you. Now, we also have loop antennas that will work well, but I think you ought to take a look at that cobweb. Yeah, I, you know, Martin, I, I'm still not convinced about these loops, these magnetic loops. Man. Mm -hmm. I just don't see how something that small can work. And well, someday you're going to have to tell me and show me how something that small can generator signal oh I, I would do that they they truly do work and I have studied those for the last 25 years and they're based uh, in science and they truly do work uh, wow. we, but we'll make a topic out of it sometime well I guess so but one thing about that that loop is isn't it fairly narrow band well uh, once you tune it and if you don't retune it it's narrow but it's actually a very broadband antenna in that you can tune it okay. throughout. In, in fact, the one that we have covers 10 through 30 megahertz continuously. Now, the thing about a loop antenna is if you don't build those uh, properly, they don't work at all. And most mm -hmm. of the loops that you see 
that are being sowed just barely work because the loop has got very, very low radiation resistance. In fact, the one that we have uses a, an aluminum tubing that's 1.05 inches in diameter and the radiation resistance of that loop, which is uh, 30 inches in diameter, it's about 50 milliohms. So every connection wow. has to be uh, welded or soldered, cannot be any kind of uh, rotating contacts. But if you do that, they work really good. The, it, on 20 meters, our 30 inch loop has an efficiency of 62%. Now what that means is if you put 100 watts into your antenna, 62 watts is being radiated. Now that's less than a half an S unit difference on the receive side, you can't tell the difference between that and the full-size dipole, which is about a 98% efficient. But a full-size dipole would be about 33 feet compared to 30 inches for the loop. Well, I tell you, you know, I've been electronics all my life and member of the IEEE and engineer, and I never really worked much with milliohms. I didn't, you know, just never heard milliohms used that much. <laughs> yeah. But we're getting in ham hey, radio now. We're getting into the milliohms, guys. What's the what's the impedance of that antenna? Well, once it's transformed, it's 50 ohms. But the actual radiation resistance, the part of the antenna that does does the radiating, is only 50 milliohms. 50 milliohms is 0.05 ohms. Wow, that's pretty small. I guess there's some critical stuff going on to match uh, that. We think 12 and a half ohms in a cobweb is bad. Yeah. Uh, you, you're, I mean, you're practically matching a, a direct short. Almost. Well, well, you yeah. are, but you know the matching technique that we use is pretty much lossless. It's mm -hmm. it's basically a transformer. We have a small loop that couples into the big loop, so the losses isn't in the matching network. It's in the actual uh, resistance of the components. Yeah, the loss resistance of the components. Yeah, our friend in Barcelona there says he he's a happy user of the uh, your uh, MFJ uh, noise canceller. Oh wow! It okay. solved his electrical QRM on seventeen and fifteen. So well, well that's great. I appreciate you using it. Let me just talk about that for a minute. You know the um, noise canceller canceller that we have. What it does is it uses your receive, your actual uh, antenna, your transmit and receive antenna, and then there's another smaller antenna that you use to pick up the noise that's causing you problems. And uh, what we do is to combine those two signals together at RF level and then adjust the amplitude and the phase of the noise signal until just the noise gets canceled out. And it, it really does work, and it works very well. Well, that's great. You know, I, I know some people have really, really hard problems with, with uh, noise. They just can't operate with it. And it sounds like uh, our friend in Barcelona, is, uh, by this device has made two of his bands operational there, so that's, that's uh, great. Yeah. <clears throat> no, it's, it's great if you have a noise source and... Uh, it, it, it tunes it out. I see a comment here about um, most loops are being uh, for receive only. Um, uh, well, um, it's much easier to make a loop for receive. If you make a loop for transmit, it's much, much more difficult to make it work properly, and that's because of the low radiation resistance. I mean, every connection has to be welded or soldered. There cannot be any rotating contacts like on a capacitor. Uh, if you look at our capacitor, that the variable capacitor has no rotating contacts at all. And it's almost as good as a vacuum variable capacitor. And I, I noticed that all your loop antennas, everything's welded. Even, the, even the, all the plates and the capacitors and the loop, everything is welded. Well, it is. And you uh, got to do that for, for that. <coughs> It is. Every, everything is welded, and we're the only one that builds a loop like that. Uh, and we weld every connection. Well, that's, uh, that's cool. I see. You know, Martin, uh, as you go down lower in frequency, 
Seems like you pick up a lot more noise. And what do you think about this new 630 meter band? Well, you know, we've, we've got a new band coming out now. And I bet, I mean, you guys have any products for 630 uh, meters now? Well, yeah. Uh, uh, we're going to add those bands to our antenna analyzer. And uh, we've gotten some comments about the uh, Maritime ALS <coughs> 500. Uh, they're using those on the new 630 meter band. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, the antenna analyzer would be very important on this band because your ground losses and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And uh, uh, our friend John uh, Langridge, who had an experimental license for this band, you know, he had to, to give the FCC a lot of information about ground loss impedance and different things. And, and uh, I think they uh, were using some equipment, maybe even one of the MFJ analyzers that they had modded, they put mm -hmm. a mod in to make it go down to that frequency. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important if we're going to start working these bands that people have equipment that will see that. Mm -hmm. And it, it shouldn't be too hard for you to bring those analyzers down. No, it right. it isn't. You know, the uh, uh, MFJ 259 and 269 has got two uh, band switches on it, and both of them are six position, and we're only using four positions uh, on one of the band switch, so we can very easily add that to it. In fact, if you have one, you can add it on to it yourself. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Well, um you know, there are a few little kits out to get you on 630 meters now, a transmitter. I think for probably under a couple hundred bucks, you might can get some type of transmitter. I, I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the ham radios will tune down mm -hmm. that, you know, your, your transceivers will tune down to the 470 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Not sure how good the receiver uh, is, but... <laughs> Well, you know, the big problem is going to be the antenna. Yeah. That's, um, but, you know, that's down just below the broadcast band, and <clears> there's <throat> been lots of experience in those frequency ranges. But it, it's going to be a pretty exciting band for, the, for us as hams. Well, we've already seen people talking from California to um, to Hawaii on that band. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, and you know, that's the 472 kilohertz band, but the 2200 is also approved now, 137 kilohertz. That's getting yeah. on down there. Yeah, it is getting on down. That's going to that's gonna be a real <clears throat> challenge, but that's what ham radio is about. It's about being challenged. <clears throat> so, so, you know, a lot of things that came around in radio were... were experiments that ham radio operators oh hams I mean, brought a lot of technology into yeah. radio well i guess you know people i guess you could consider marconi and mm -hmm. people like that a ham oh yeah i guess right I mean, oh yeah they brought right. radio to us right that right right and from radio came tv yeah yeah that was simple just throw a picture on top of it and and you know now you got a radio with pictures so. yeah yeah so a lot of things have come uh, around uh, from from ham radio and uh, probably a lot of this digital stuff i don't I, I couldn't even tell you i need to research it someday and just think of all the things that yeah. uh, ham radio has brought well you know back in in the very early days of satellite to sputnik you know there were a lot of hams that uh, picked up sputnik mm -hmm. oh yeah so martin what kind of uh Hey, when you were, you got your license about what age? 14, uh, 15, 16? 16 years old, That's yeah. when I got mine, 16. So Is what it, kind of projects did you, you build growing up? You, you obviously built stuff. Well, yeah, just out of old radio parts from the radio TV repairman. You know, I had been interested in that much earlier, but I didn't know any hams. And um, I finally discovered the a ham in Hollandale, Mississippi, where I grew up, when I had built a crystal radio, and late one evening uh, during a summer when it was really hot, uh, just laying in bed listening to my crystal radio, I heard somebody break in and started talking. Mm. And uh, of course, you know, a crystal radio. It wasn't very selective, was it? It wasn't very selective. He was on 75 meters AM. I could hear him very clearly. 
and I finally discovered who he was and just went over and visited him. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it um, had been earlier, I would have gotten a ham license earlier, but that was the only uh, way that I found out about ham radio. But so that that was your crystal. You built a crystal radio, but I I think you told me the first crystal you built didn't work. Well, right. it it didn't. The first one I built was called a Foxo crystal radio, which were built during World War II, and the crystal detector was a rusty razor blade with a piece of pencil lead, and you moved it around until you could hear a signal. But being in Cub Scouts and being at uh, age. Eight, you know, you didn't know you had to have an antenna big enough to pick up a signal. Um, yeah. But the one that I built when I listened uh, was hearing that ham in Hollandale was actually a crystal radio with a transistor as an audio amplifier. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, um... Okay, now you tuned that by moving the little pencil lid, I guess, right? Well, or that was the Fox hole. That one. That was the Fox yeah. hole. One. This transistor radio used a crystal dial, a 1N34 crystal detector. Okay. So you didn't have to move it around. And I guess you had a little slider on a, a little coil you wound or well, something? Well, I think this one... Or did one it have a capacitor? It had a capacitor okay. on it, yeah. One of those plastic ones. Well, you know, hey, if somebody wants to build one, that's a simple radio to build now. It don't have but about four parts in it, does yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. And you know? I think the earphone, I can't remember if it was a crystal earphone or it was one of the magnetic earphones. In fact, I found that radio on eBay, so I now have a copy of that radio. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> We just had uh, Glenn Popel join us, KW5GP, the author of um, Arduino for Ham Radio, several ARL books, and also Mesh Networks. And uh, uh, hello, Glenn. Glad to glad to see you here. And uh, uh, we meet again, but this time uh, uh, through Tom instead of at Costco here in Memphis. Oh, all right. <laughs> So okay, so you 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 build uh, some crystal sets, well, you, but knowing you, you you advanced past that. You you built some other stuff. Well, I remember building a uh, transmitter uh, using a okay. Back then, we had ACDC five tube radio. They were yep. called the All American five tube radio, and um, uh, all. Uh, the filaments, uh, all those tubes were put in series, so it mm -hmm. didn't have a transformer. And I remember <clears> building <throat> a uh, transmitter with the audio output tube, a 50C5, and um, I think there was a 6C4 that was used as a crystal oscillator. And um, no, I, no, you know, I think that might have been a 6AQ5. This was mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. different, but it's still the same type of tube. And uh, audio output tube, it puts maybe a, a watt of audio out, but I remember uh, driving that thing to 22 watts of input power and the plate would turn red when you keyed it That's down. That's a lot of power. <laughs> a little tube about the size yeah. of your thumb right there, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, man, I remember those radios well. All I'm starting to forget, but those uh, ACDC sets, like Martin said, uh, the, all the filaments were in series and hooked across 110 volts. and. Uh, the audio output was a 50C5, and the uh, uh, rectifier was a 35W4. And I forget the other three. They were 12 something. Uh, uh, let's see. 12A, T6, maybe, or something like um, that. Shoot, I can't remember now. I, I can't remember the 12 ones. Well, there was a uh, mixer oscillator. Uh -huh. um, 6BE6, 12BE6. 12BE6, I guess. 12BA6. Yeah. So, guys, tube. Yeah, so, guys, if you, if you take those five tubes, the, and and the first number on the tube there designated the filament voltage. 50 C5 as 50 volts, 35 W4 as 35 volts. So you start adding all those up: 50, 35, 12, 12, and 12. And I think that came out somewhere around 110 or 115 volts. And and uh, you just man, no transformer. You just put 115 volts across there. And you know, hey, one tube go out. All tubes go out, yeah. you know, so. And you had to be careful on how you plugged it into the wall. Um, you know, you would only plug it in wrong one time if you ever touched it. 
Well, you know, but you know the thing about it, most of those back then were in plastic cases That's or true. something like that. And, That's but true. I tell you, you ever take the knob off <laughs> and touch that touch that shaft that knob was on, that'll get you. I remember that. But uh, you know, there's been a lot of safety improvements, I guess, for the better. You know, the three prong plug, mm -hmm. the uh, the the you know with the ground in it, and uh, of course, uh, I'm trying to think. Did did uh, was our plug polarized before the ground hole was put in there? In other words, I know one slot's bigger than the other. Or did I, that come about the same time the ground came? I don't think they were polarized even back then. Well, no, back then, because you could put that plug in either yeah, way. Yeah, And And yeah. as Martin was saying, if you stick that plug in and turn it over the wrong way, that chassis has 110 volts on it. And uh, that was uh, uh, pretty pretty uh, bad to, to get your hand on that and against something else. Well, you and know, I've made sparks before, you know, just, oh, you know, plug oh, stuff yeah, in. And, yeah. Well, I remember um, the first time I learned about that was up in the attic of the store, grocery store, where I had my radio transmitter. It was a home-built transmitter, and um, I touched the wrong point on the radio and it just threw me back but that only happened once <laughs> you know martin I, I used to do crazy things uh a teenager experiment with stuff and uh you know in, in in my little town we had we had you know the water system it was all metal pipe and we had gas it came into a metal pipe and and uh, another kid and I, we, we played around experimenting one day. He had a house, three or four houses down. And we tied a speaker to his gas pipe and his water pipe. And then I took the output of my, my radio and put it on a gas pipe and a water pipe. And even though both of them are grounded, he could actually hear the music coming out down his house. So we were communicating through gas and water pipes. Huh. Isn't that something? Oh, man. Now... There was even a uh, little hack back many years ago with those radios, and I don't remember. I think you can look it up on the internet today, but you could actually make some wiring changes in one of those 5T radios and actually turn it into a transmitter, into an AM transmitter. Well, I missed that. Say that again. There was a there was a little hack that uh, was back then where you could take uh, one of those ACDC radios and make a couple of wiring changes and make it into a broadcast transmitter mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. put our own radio station on you know using that mm -hmm. oh so but you've got up to, you you must have got up to bigger and better things uh, <coughs> bigger transmitters now transmitters were easy to build back yeah. then much easier than yeah. than a receiver you know um well i i, I built several things um you know this was um uh, you know, we had to work in the store a lot, you know, didn't have a lot of time. Yeah. <coughs> well, Glenn Popel mentions there, polar, polarized doesn't always matter. He, he had a house built and he had the wires reversed uh, in his house. So that would be bad, you know. You need to get an inspector to check that or buy you one of those little uh, plugs you stick in it, you know, mm -hmm. test the wiring there. Uh you know, back back then we were a lot of stuff we got was old military mm -hmm. junk, but it was good for parts. Oh, it was. You know that that wasn't very long after World War II, and the market was flooded. Um, there used to be a company I forgot. I think they were in Kansas City, called B A Bernstein Appleby. They sold mm -hmm. lots of uh, war war uh, World War War two two. Yeah. surplus equipment and you could buy the 12 volt equivalent of the 807 tube for like 25 cents a piece and uh, you know there were a lot of transmitter based on the uh, 807s yeah the 807 was a was that a 6 volt tube um, the 1625 was, was a 12 volt version 12 volt yeah I, I think that's right yeah and uh, you know the uh, the 807? Yeah, the 807 too. Mm -hmm. Was very popular back then. In fact, uh, 
Hey, I'm starting calling beer. Yeah. What, 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 uh, yeah. 807, yeah. right? That's yeah, right. Give me an 807. <laughs> uh, beer became the, uh, the term for an 807 back then. Um, well, I built a few things with uh, some 807s or 1625s, but uh, I, I, I kind of got more into the 6146 tubes, you mm -hmm. know, and, and uh, that's kind of where I built some of my transmitters uh, back then. Uh, they probably ran a little bit more power, had a little bit more plate dissipation, I guess. Um, so, Martin, you've been a ham a long time like me. Um, and we were talking earlier, things like DXCC and worked all states. You know, I never, I don't have a single certificate. I've been a ham 54 years. I don't have a worked all state certificate. I don't have DXCC, although I probably have worked all those countries. What mm -hmm. about you? Well, I'm the same way. My interest was more in uh, the equipment and just playing with antennas uh, rather than operating. Um, you know, I, I like the operating part of it, but that wasn't my main interest. So, just like you, I don't have any certificates either. Yeah, well, I work them and I get satisfaction yeah. from, you know, putting them in a log and. Yeah. Uh, uh, just never did uh, send it off and, and get the uh, and get any of the certificates there. Okay, uh, let's see. We'll probably close this down in just a minute here. Um, let's see if we got any more questions uh, from the chat room there or the phone if you want to call in. 901-286-1116. And uh, we're talking with uh, Martin Jew today and about everything. The old days, antennas, tubes, everything. So, uh, let me see. Now, Martin, you uh, you're gonna have to join our Facebook group. I'm gonna get you signed up on that. Okay. You're not you're not doing a lot of Facebook stuff, but uh, we really appreciate you coming on a show like this, being part of our show, and and uh, helping to to uh, answer questions. Hey, hey, you know, one of the things I, I, I had on my notes I, I forgot to mention, uh, I was looking at a video the other day, uh, this LD MOS, LD MOS transistors are coming out now, high power transistors, one transistor can run uh, one and a half kilowatts or more, and I was, I was seeing a demo, a demonstration of that uh, LD MOS transistor. And they would tune up, and they would take the, the dummy load off and, and put full power into nothing. It was open. And then the guy took a screwdriver, and he was shorting out the, uh, the, the coax connector. And, boy, it was making some sparks there. And it never, ever blew that transistor. And I hear you guys are working on something that, that yeah. will take it's similar to that. I mean, and we're talking about SWRs of 65 to 1. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we do. We have... Uh an amplifier that's been in use for, I don't know, last five or six months for two meters that uses the new version of that LD MOS transistor that mm -hmm. was in that video. But we're going to bring out a whole line using those type of transistors uh, all the way from HF through VHF and UHF. Well, that's one of the things I've always worried about was the solid state. And, you know, me being a tube guy and an old hound, I know a tube can probably handle more issues maybe than a transistor. And, and transistors are getting better. You know, used to. Boy, you could blow a transistor out in, in almost, you know, easy. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, re I remember the, when I was a kid buying these transistors. The first one that was widely available t to hobbyists was the uh, Raytheon CK722. And, you you know, you look at those things wrong, they would burn out on you. I mean, they're very, very fragile, but mm -hmm. it's come a long way since then. There were two transistors that were real popular, the GE version, which was the 2N107, and then that, and the Raytheon one, which was the first ones, they were rejects, um, CK722. There's uh, lots of us grew up on those transistors. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, I think we had a pretty good talk. We talked about a little bit of everything. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. And we had uh, some good questions that came in in the chat room and a couple of callers. 
Guys, I want to thank everybody out there for uh, tuning in tonight. We've uh, shows this run about an hour. Uh, before before I do get off here, let me uh, let me just take a quick break here. Contest season is here. Icom's high performance and innovative transceivers will help you make the most out of the contest season. Continue your contesting momentum with the IC7300. Ideal for the ham on the go, it's a high performance HF transceiver with a compact design. It has RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. The IC7851 will give you the competitive edge you've been looking for. Raise the bar and hear what others cannot hear with this HF through 50 MHz transceiver. Features include reciprocal mixing dynamic range, a clear crystal local oscillator design, a spectrum scope, dual receivers, and digital voice recorder. Don't forget about the IC7700 and the IC7600. Both of these top-of-the-line transceivers are still available and are sure to be the perfect companion for this contesting season. Visit www.icomamerica.com amateur for more information on ICOM radios. All right, we're back, and uh, hey, again, guys, it's, uh, Thanksgiving is here in just a couple of days. Uh, everybody have a great Thanksgiving out there, and uh, uh, we uh, appreciate everybody that's uh, joined us on the show tonight, and uh, we really appreciate you being a part of our webcast. Help us spread the word. Help us bring some new people in here, and uh, uh, the show is here to help hams get questions answered and help new people, and uh uh, just uh, share our, our experiences. Uh, thanks a lot for those that called in and sent uh, questions in. We really appreciate it. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me, Tom, and appreciate it, everybody that called in. All right, well, send me three to everybody. Thank you. Well, guys, I think we had a great show tonight. Believe it or not, I'm in North Carolina. Kathy and I are at our home in uh, the Smoky Mountains over in western North Carolina in a little, little town or a little uh, community called Tuckaseegee. If you've never uh, heard of Tuckaseegee, look it up. Uh, the, uh, the city's about the size of a pinhead uh, on the map there. Anyway, some, if somebody will put in a Hangout link in the chat room, we'll try to join you um, in the uh, Hangout. And uh, I'm in the chat room also. So, semi threes. We'll see you guys uh, next week. And uh, thanks a lot for for showing up and uh, joining the webcast tonight. <laughs>